everyone. Welcome to the Metal Voice. First time on the show, Shuri Curry. How are you doing today? Oh, Jimmy, great. Thank you for being so patient. It really, really matters to me. It's yeah, been, I've been so busy, and I really, really thank you for being patient. Thank you. It's, it's great to be on your show. Thank you for being on. Good news. You're going on a European tour correct? I am. It starts at July 25th, probably all the way to the beginning of August. And the cool news is you're playing Wacken in Germany. Yes, I am. I'm looking forward to that. Is that your first time? Yes. Oh, yes. oh absolutely. I mean, all of these places, I'm actually looking at the uh, schedule. I haven't played any of these uh, places. And uh, gosh, it just only took me 48 years. <laughs> Who would have thought, right? Better late than never, though, right? Yeah, it's great. Stevie Rochelle is I just also... Wanna... Go ahead. Pardon sorry. me? Stevie Rochelle was going to say, but go ahead. What uh, do you say? Stevie, yeah, we're going to do a duet together. I'm looking so forward to that. I mean, he's such a great guy. And what a showman, you know? And Alex Michael, who has been a, a longtime friend, uh, we met because I ended up going in to do a session for him. And we have, you know, Alex and I have traveled. I mean, I took him to New Zealand and Australia as well. We've done so many UK tours. Uh, and, you know, what what a great guy. What a great guy. And he just has a head for business, you know. That's what I don't have. Uh, when, I, when I took myself on tour with the Blackheart debacle, uh, where they, you know, wouldn't release my record and after I opened for Joan, uh, and I won performance of the year. Uh, I never worked again under Blackheart. And so when my management contract was up, I went on tour and, um, you know, I, I was the manager and I really realized, I mean, I could do it, but it's not my bag. Like, does it blow your mind that the music of the runaways has sort of grown? The demand is actually, uh, grown over time to the point where you're, you know, you're at you're at Vakken, right? And you could still tour in the U in Europe. Um, how does that make you feel? The music has lasted this long. Well, it's great music, and I think I think what sets it apart, and even like Slash, and I mean all these really big time, well known, legendary players love it because it's easy, it's simple. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you anyone can play it and anyone can sing it. And I think that that is the attraction for most younger kids mm -hmm. that are picking up an instrument for the first time uh, and wanting to uh, play rock and roll is that it's just simple and it's it's to the core and uh, people can do it and they appreciate that, you know. Do, do you think the movie gave a second life to the Runaways? It, you know, for example, Anvil, the band, you know, they were sort of struggling at one point. Their, their documentary comes out and suddenly it breathed new life into the band. Now they're known all around the world. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, when I opened for Joan, I had little kids crying, you know, to meet me. And, and you know, that mattered because the Runaways, I thought, were all but forgotten in the 90s, uh, about nine, I, 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 I couldn't even watch videos or anything after our breakup. <clears throat> it was it was hard, very, very hard, because, you know, the ending was so devastating. Uh, and again, it was because we were just worked to the bone, to the bone, we never had any time off, we weren't being paid. Uh, and and there was this inner friction within the band that we didn't have a mediator. If we would have had a mediator, <laughs> pardon me, uh, it would have made such a difference. But Kim Fowley seemed to believe, <clears throat> and he regretted this, uh, you know, for the rest of his life. He just believed that if there was tension, that there, it would be, you know, more rock and roll uh, on stage, that it would just have this grittiness. But unfortunately, we were too young to handle it. You know, 16, 17, 18, you know, what child? And we're, chi we're, we're children. Is, what it, children is it true he threw that? stuff at you? Is it true he threw stuff oh, sure. at you? It oh, yeah. He did that at SIR on Sunset Boulevard. He would uh, have people come in and throw trash and <clears throat> trying to get us uh, ready for, for, for anything. 
Yeah, I miss him. It's funny. Boot, boot camp, I, I, boot camp, right? It was, it was Runaways Boot Camp. And, you know, I loathed Kim Fowley, reasonably so. Uh, you know, I got hit by the IRS as soon as I left the band. I thought all the girls had been uh, for money that I never made and that I was forced to pay. And uh, I, 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 I loathed him for many reasons. Uh, but then as when I heard he was sick, I had seen him at a party and I just really realized, Jimmy, that this hatred that I had hurt only me and that this was so unhealthy. And I just decided that I was going to hand an olive branch. And so when I saw him at this uh, party over at the Houdini mansion, I, I, he was kind of expecting me to want to push him in a pool or something like that. And I, and I told him, I said, let's talk. And so we did, and we talked for hours and he, he cried literally. I mean, now I, I could, didn't see the tears, but he knew that he had made a grave mistake. And not only that, I left right when we were more than likely going to have a, a huge hit. And, uh, and then when he got ill, uh, I moved him into my home and took care of him towards wow. the end of his life. That's, that's... And he was bedridden. So we're talking bedpans and we're talking sponge baths. And, uh, you know, it was the best time of my life. We recorded, we wrote, and I loved him when he died. And so all, 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 the, all the feelings that would have been hatred is love now. And, uh, and listen, you know, you got to forgive. You got to forgive. Uh, I'm so glad that I did. When you're talking about IRS, is it because you had advances that you weren't aware of against those albums? Absolutely not. This was, this was Kim because he actually even had my twin sister. He claimed that she also owed $20,000 in taxes. Uh, so this was him being a conniving, shyster, uh, con man. And even though my father, God rest his soul, you know, he turned to these agents and he said, I, you can look at my accounts and because all of our money went into one account because we were living under the a, a three bedroom house, five of us living. Uh, it was a, it was a wonderful, loving place, but, uh, I'll never forget this, this agent turning around, this young guy, cocky guy. And he turned around and he goes, Mr. Curry, we don't give a damn. She made the money or not. She's going to pay it. And I paid $100 a month from the time I was 17 until I married Robert Hayes in 1990. And he just happened to see me writing out another $100 check. And he paid it off. At that time, I owed about $2,600. And, you know, $100 for, for someone like me who decided to go into retail and I became, you know, I was like in the uh, co-manager for a learner store. I started working at the mall because I really craved wanting to know what being normal was. Uh, I'll tell you, I mean, it was, it was uh, quite an experience and it was directly across from a record store. And people would come in with and say, with you know, with a record, asking me to sign it, saying, "What are you doing?" It, uh, Rosanna Arquette, who's a friend, walked in and said, "Shree, what the hell are you doing here?" And I said, "I'm working. What does it look like I'm doing?" You know, I really embraced and enjoyed that time. It was hard. I mean, it was hard. My feet were swollen from being on my feet all day, and I worked really, really hard. I needed that. I needed that. I wanted it, and uh, it just kind of shaped me who I am today. Well, that's good. I, I love all these positive messages you have. You know, uh, being you humbled yourself basically working retail. I mean, a lot of stars, it's uh, or or you know, a lot of people would not do that. That is that is the the opposite of what they would do. Well, uh, I, I didn't consider it humbling myself. I considered it a. a a hunger to know what normality was. I was swept up in the runaways. You know, I did, I don't even have a 10th grade education. I mean, three months into 10th grade, they pulled me out to go on tour with the runaways. 
saying that I was going to get credit, you know, uh, school credit for it never happened. Uh, I have a worldly education. Uh, I'm very observant. And, uh, you know, it was my path, I guess, there, Jimmy. We <laughs> yes, all have a path, don't we? That's right. Do you mind if I just take this right off my screen really quick? Thank you. It's all right. It's just reminding me of, of something that I have to do later. It's okay. So in other words, he cooked the books. He claimed that you made more money than you actually of did. Of course. Right? Well, he, he was stealing all the money. So he had to find some way to not pay the taxes for the money that he stole. Because the run we made nothing. I mean nothing. The Japan tour, which was the last tour I did, was the only tour where we made money. And we're t I'm talking about us selling out huge venues, uh, merchandise, up the kazoo, tens of thousands of dollars made a night. And we were paid, each one of us made, uh, got a check for about $1,700. To us, it was, we were rich. And um, I can't even imagine the amount of money that the Runaways made on these tours. I can't even imagine. After 35 and, years. And, you know, we like... never got any royalties either. We ended up having to turn around and sue Kim Fowley and Polly Graham Mercury uh, to get our royalties. And that was in 1997. But unfortunately, they take 50% of uh everything and uh you know right now it's 30 years so i'm gonna have to uh start that's disputing that that's it's what i was awful... gonna just say yeah, yeah, yeah. yes it's an awful lot of money that they take uh jackie fuchs is not involved because she had cut a deal behind all of our backs in the early 90s uh really up really upset me because she's a lawyer and i thought why didn't she represent us all you know but she she was all for herself she still is and like, uh, you know, it is what it is. But uh, but anyway, <laughs> the movie, it's, it's, the it's, movie. A, it's, it's a fascinating movie. How much of it would you say was exaggerated? How much of it wasn't real and how much of it was real? Well, I, I can't say it was exaggerated at all. What I what I will say is that uh, me and Floria Sigismonte. Uh, Art uh, Linson, uh, of course, uh, you know, we had to go because uh, Floria, for some reason, my book, and I don't know if you've read it or not, Neon Angel, that no. because they based they based the movie on my original 1989 paperback. And uh, I don't know why she didn't think that there were enough treacherous stories in there. But she actually wanted me to, uh, in, in one scene, she wanted my character, I'm going to say, uh, be, be in some hotel room blowing crack cocaine in a dog's face. And I told her, first of all, I will sue you if you even attempt this, because then I'll have people hating me for something that I would never do. But. You know, she changed things around. Like I wore, wore the corset for the first time in in Japan, you know, I wore the corset almost right out the gate, and it was a calling. You know, I mean, I literally we were um, headlining at the Starwood, and there was a little little boutique across the street with a single corset in the window. Mm -hmm. And at Soundcheck, I saw it. It was like gleaming. It was bizarre. And I walked across the street and I literally pressed my face into the window and I was staring at it and I walked in and I tried it on. And you know that voice in your head, Jimmy? It's always right. It's always right. I wouldn't be a chainsaw artist without that voice. I would never have uh, been in a position to join the Runaways if not for that voice. But that voice said, you need to wear this for Cherry Bomb. And uh, so that was basically... I'd say I'd, you know, write within the first year, easy. Uh, maybe the first few months is when uh, I I bought that corset. You know, we interviewed Alita Ford and asked her, "What do you think about the movie? Her depiction in the movie?" And she goes, "I didn't see it. I never saw it." Now I don't know if that's true or not, but 
re when I rewatched the movie, I probably could see why she said that because I guess her character in the movie was portrayed a little more to the side versus you and Joan Jett, perhaps. Well, it wasn't supposed to be that way, Jimmy. Unfortunately, Lita's husband, Jim, uh, when they got the contract, he told her that that her life rights were she was going to get a thousand dollars. Well, which is completely wrong. I, I mean, we all were getting the same thing. We got a thousand to consider, uh, twenty thousand uh, for it. I mean, we're not talking big money, but she was. They wanted her to be a part of it, as well as Jackie Fuchs, who turned around and told them that she demanded something like five times more than what Joan and I were making. And uh, that's all they needed to hear. They just told her, we're, we're just going to kick you to the curb. I mean, we're, we're done. We're just going to, we don't need you. And she goes, oh, I'll do it for free at that time. You know, sometimes people make mistakes when, they're, when you're not a team player. But on Lita's uh, situation, had she read that contract, she would have seen that her husband uh, wasn't really, uh, didn't have her best interest at heart. Having Lita involved would have been fantastic. It would have changed the movie. But to, honestly, I do have to say for for, for everything involved, all-encompassing, to have Dakota Fanning playing me, who was my favorite actor, uh, and Kristen Stewart as Joan, and Michael Shannon. What a great cast. I agree. Unfortunately, I agree. It, had they, and I wish Floria would have been, you know, quicker on getting this film, not going back. And, you know, I mean, there was such a hype for it. It needed to come out right then. And she kept pulling it back and she blew the whole thing. I mean, had, had she just let it organically and, and stick to the, to the calendar, I think it would have done far better. Yeah, uh, that was my next question. What will you have changed? But I think you answered that. Uh, you know, the famous scene in that movie when you guys pee on the equipment of the the rock stars who were, I guess, uh, not giving you as much love. I know this is already public. I mean, I think Joan Jett already mentioned that, you know, it was Rush. Uh, and and it's, it's an odd picture that you have sitting for Mercury. You took for Mer Mercury Records. You're sitting, I don't know where, in some restaurant. Right. You're sitting there with Rush. What were your thoughts? Okay, they just forced us to. Like, what were you thinking when you were sitting there with them? Well, actually, that that picture was taken uh, right after soundcheck, I believe. Um, we had been treated so well by Tom Petty, who opened for us, Cheap Trick, who opened for us, uh, Randy uh, California was wonderful, but Rush. Uh, they they sabotaged our set, and I noticed. And we're at Cobo Hall; it's a big venue. And they were, and I saw them, and they were throwing pieces of paper, just like standard eight by ten paper, onto the stage, whipping it like a you would a pizza, right? And I was in six inch platform boots, and I had to jump off of Sandy's drum riser. And I hit one of those pieces of paper and I slid across that stage and there was an orchestra pit with all the photographers. And I'll never forget seeing them reach up with fear that I was going to go over. And somehow, some way I caught myself right at the last minute and did one of those, you know, to, to one of the photographers. I came so close to, I could have been paralyzed. I mean, I'm not, and I'm not overstating. I could, I would have been, very much injured had I gone off that stage. And uh, so that that's why Joan and I in particular don't care much for them because they, 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 they weren't protecting us. They were sabotaging us that night. And, uh, and they would be sitting there going <laughs> behind the, uh, you know, I'd lead his amp. So I didn't, uh, you know, we don't but, care but, much. But, but I mean, the ping story was confirmed as true, right? Sorry, the peeing story. You know, I, I I wasn't there. I didn't okay, pee on okay. anybody's. No, nah, not me. If it was, if if it did happen, could have been Joan and Lita. Yeah, I think but it, it was, was not me. Yeah, yeah, I think it was Joan. Yeah, and I, you know, and again, the, it's, again, Jimmy, it's hard for me to imagine that Joan was very subdued and self conscious, and uh, 
I don't really see that happening personally. I'm not saying that it didn't because I wasn't there, but uh, so. No, no. If you weren't there, you weren't there. That's all. I there wasn't is. there. No. Yeah. Tell, tell me about the vocal duties. I always found this peculiar. You know, you had the lead singer, which was you, which you had a great voice and you still do. But, but I couldn't sing to save my, I couldn't sing to save my life when I was that. a kid. <laughs> I, I don't know about that. For, for a 15, 16 year old, you had a very mature voice. Like you wouldn't know it was a teenager singing, right? I mean, you could listen to bands well, today who you. are young. Yeah. Why did they go with Joan? And, and she's got a great voice too. Don't get me wrong, but you're kind of the front woman here. Why did they, did you guys trade off on vocals on the studio albums? Oh, right. Well, right out the gate. I mean, you know, like You Drive Me Wild is one of my favorite Joan songs. And I actually talked her into adding that to her set about 10 years ago. I don't know if she's still using it, but um, it was great because, uh, you know, in the 70s, all you have to do is look at Elton John, look at Alice Cooper. These were very theatrical shows. We didn't have the budget for that kind of theatrics, but we did have Kenny Ortega, who, uh, you know, was the main choreographer for the tubes. He, he ended up being the choreographer for Michael Jackson mm -hmm. at the end of his life. And a, he was a great director. I love Kenny. And I felt the need to have costume changes to at least put a little bit of, uh, theatrics in and, and have so Joan would sing songs. I'd be changing. It, it worked out great. And also, I love Joan. I I I wanted her to sing. You know, I mean, I think the problem that ended up happening was the press. You know, putting me on the covers of all the magazines. When you're dealing with kids that are insecure, because all kids are insecure. I don't care who you are. We didn't even know who we were at that time. In fact, I didn't know who I was. So I, Bowie was my guy. And Joan, it was Susie Quattro. And we both kind of pretended to be them until we could find out who we were. So it was, it was the press and, and putting, but again, you know, that's what they did. Put lead singers on, 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 and on the covers, but uh, it caused a lot of friction and especially the first album cover, the runaways album cover that Tom gold shot. I begged them. I begged them like I begged Rolling Stone because they had a photograph they wanted mm -hmm. to use for the cover of Rolling. So I told them, I begged them. I said, if you do, if you put that, if you put me on that cover, that will be the end of the runaways. And I was in tears and it wasn't two weeks later. I ended up quitting. I wished I would have, allowed i wish i would have gone along a bit on the cover at this point uh these are things that we didn't have control over or i certainly didn't um so when you're young and you don't have anyone to to help us talk things out that was the demise of the runaways and having our money stolen and not having any breaks whatsoever do you, I mean, do you think a band like the Runaways can exist today? I mean, given like you guys were, I don't know, put through a ringer, I guess I could, I'll just using a, a light term, putting, put through the ringer, a bunch of sure. underage girls. Um, I guess I could think of baby metal. I wonder what their lives will be like 20 years from now. I don't know if they're going to need therapy. I don't know, but. Well, you know, again, I don't even know how it happened that we would be playing over 21 clubs or over 21 bars being 16. 15, 16, 17. Uh, I don't really know how that that happened, to be honest. Um, but now at least there's laws and, and, and things in place where, you know, we were brand new. We were a whole new virus. <laughs> That's right. But, those, these, but, but yeah. these laws you speak of, these are North American laws. It's not laws around the world, right? So we don't know what it's like in other places. Well, I don't know. I don't really know. Uh, I do know that with uh, social media, with the internet, um, it's been, it's actually, you might think that it's much easier to get a deal and things like that. But 
it isn't, you know, I mean, what, what happened with the internet, um, people got lazy. I mean, you don't see scouts anymore, like at the whiskey, a go-go. I mean, it's just a whole different thing. They, they want to see how many followers you have before they even consider you. I mean, people have gotten so lazy in this business and the pay to play that was the end to me for them to force bands to sell tickets. I mean, it, it really is. It's so degrading for these bands and trust me, my son has a band modeling strangers. My son is, has more talent in the tip of his little finger than Bob, Robert Hayes, and I have in our entire bodies. And it has been very hard for him. And he's 33 now, and he started playing at, at uh, 13 years old and uh, has been at it ever since. So the magic is gone. I don't, I'm actually pondering and have been ta thinking for the last uh, couple of years about having a, a night a month at at a, at a club and having and having these kids actually make money. I mean, they get the door, all of it, and uh, all I would be reimbursed is whatever PR would cost, and allow uh, really get great bands in there where they're treated well because these, these bands are not treated well. And to me, I can't even imagine the talent that has walked away from this business simply oh, because yeah. they, because they, you know, they're treated poorly and they can't make any money. And to me, that's wrong. That's very wrong. You, you were there when Van Halen was starting to rise. They were playing the whiskey. I mean, back in right. the, the late seventies, did the Runaways actually, or Van Halen, open up for the Runaways at one point? I, 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 that was, yes, and I believe I just left, but I went to the Whiskey one evening to see them, and of course Eddie became a very, very close friend to because with Steve Lukather, who my twin sister married, uh, they were best friends. So I saw Eddie a lot, but I walked in the Whiskey and there must have been ten people there. And David Lee Roth is doing the backflip off of the, the yeah. drum. I thought, wow, I mean, these guys are incredible. But, you know, they had a very humble start, you know. Uh, but they were a great band, great band. Um, the kidnapping you that you experienced that I'm pretty sure, I never read your book, but I, I've, I've read enough or I've seen enough interviews with you. That's included in your book, but that wasn't included in the movie. No. Do you wish do you wish that would have been included? It should have been. Should have been included. It did should have been. It? Yeah. Did you push to get that in the movie? No, no. Uh, I did mention it to Floria because she has me selling linen when action, you know, in the at the end of the movie while Joan is this, you know, big rising star. But literally, I, at that time that that phone call took place i was a counselor for drug addicted teens and a very successful one but they they wouldn't have that they weren't gonna end the movie with me looking like i had done anything positive um again you know she she would have loved to have me blow crack cocaine in a dog's face but you know having a kidnapping uh because i had been in the runaways and because this this maniac this murderer uh, you know, the psychotic guy got it in his head that, that I, that he and I had been together and that we lived together in Dallas, Texas and, and, and all those things that come along with it, come along with, uh, being in the public eye. Uh, there are some people that are very unwell, but I wish, I wish they would have, it would have, it would have added more depth to the film. And that seems to be the, the one complaint that a lot of people have, even though they're, now they're embracing the film more than they did when it first came out because of that lack of depth in the movie. E even with the best actors on the planet, you know, if the script isn't compelling, uh, you're going to pay a price. You know, tell me about jumping in the guy's car, right? You're Everybody's young. Everybody's adventurous, right? Um, I know I was when I was that age, right? Yes. And, and, and it's a simple little mistake that, 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 you know, how old were you? 
I was 17. I just left the runaways. And this man pulls up and, and, and again, that voice, Jimmy, that I was talking to you about, that's why I, I, I always listen now, but this man, he pulls up and it was Sheree long time. No see good looking guy. And he's in a green limousine. How have you been? And I'm thinking to myself, Ooh, I don't recognize him, but I was a people pleaser, Jimmy. I didn't want to make anyone feel bad. I didn't want to turn around and say, gosh, I, I don't remember you. I, I played along with it. And there was a guard right there to my left. My friends were right there. And uh, he says, look at my new car. And I said, well, that's nice. And he goes, well, why don't you jump in as I pull around to park? This voice immediately said, don't do it. But I looked and I saw the guard was right there. I thought for some reason that 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 they overheard him, but they didn't. And uh, it was being a people pleaser, not wanting to hurt his feelings. I don't do that anymore. It's interesting because we te we teach our kids if a man comes and he gives you candy, offers you to go in the car, don't go in the car, right? Right. But, but we can all get fooled in different ways oh, yes. in our own way, right? Well, again, you know, it comes from a place of wanting to be kind, wanting right. to be respectful right. to that person, not wanting to hurt their feelings. I don't remember him. And but yet I had this uneasy feeling in that voice telling me don't do it. But I thought, well, people are overhearing this. And uh, I thought, OK, and I got in the car and he's pointing at all the gadgets. Look at this. Look at that. And. uh you know, we're coming around this horseshoe and I saw him pass one spot and it's a limousine, right? So there were only a couple of spots that it take. And then the master locks came down and he just went right out the parking lot. Crazy. Like that. And, and then he brings you to. And I didn't have my purse. I had nothing on me. I didn't have ID, nothing. So. Yeah. How far did he take you out? Like 20 miles, 40 miles, 50 miles? No. Actually, it's so funny. I have to pass that exit often. He took me probably, I'd say, well, probably 15 miles. Um, Osborne is the exit off the, off the uh, 170 freeway. And I literally about a year and a half ago, I finally decided I was going to get off on that exit and try to find that house. I couldn't find it, but I think I got close because it was uh, in an area that was uh, desolate. Um, there were homes around, but not where I screamed enough. Trust me. No one came. No one came. How many days were you there? Oh, I was there. Well, you know, I, I, he got me probably at about 10 o'clock at night. My sister was supposed to pick me up at 11. Um, he held me until about 5 o'clock in the morning when after I talked him into that I would go back with him to Dallas. Uh, this is after I'd stabbed him with a knife. Uh, I'm lucky. I'm very lucky he didn't kill me. Uh, but, but I literally was so desperate. Because he kept telling me, he told me he'd killed six women and he was going to kill me. And that, you know, I was going to be, my body be thrown up up on Mulholland Drive. Uh, so I was in that kind of terror. So, but he was literally, after I'd stabbed him, he, he was beating me. He drugged me, he knocked me to the ground and, and drugged me by my hair into the bedroom. And he literally straddled me and was punching me in the face where I started to go unconscious. And then I heard this voice saying, don't you remember we used to do this? We, I was just playing. I was just playing. You know, I didn't mean it. You know, I, well, I love you. We'll go back. And I'm thinking, what? who is that? someone in the room because literally i was just falling into this blackness of unconsciousness and all of a sudden the blows became less and less and less and i said take me home and i'll get my stuff and we could be together and he believed it 
it bought me my life is what it did. And uh, I'll never forget. He's driving me to, I didn't have an apartment. I lived with my, with my family, but I told him to take me to my friend, uh, Vicki Ronald's apartment and, and uh, my dear friend, Andy Raffles. I knew he would be there. I knew they were searching for me at this time because I left my purse. So my sister got to the sugar shack knowing uh, that something very bad had happened. No one had seen me. My purse was there. So uh, I had him drive me to, to Vicky's apartment. And while we're driving there, I mean, I'm caked in blood. And I was sitting in the, in the passenger seat. And I remember looking over for, with a woman at a stop sign, a stoplight. And I just remember her turning like this and just going <gasps> like that. And that's when I realized, because I, I didn't know what I looked like. But he had beaten me horrendously and uh anyway i he he brought me down into the underground parking lot and i said i'll be right back and i get out and i get into the stairwell and i collapsed i mean i just literally fell on the floor and i crawled up the stairs and i got to the apartment and i knocked on the door and andy opens that door and he lifted me up and i just said he's downstairs that's all i said and Andy grabbed a butcher knife and a flashlight, and he went out that door and got his license plate. Because at this time, he's, because it took me some time, I could barely walk, you know, to, to get up to the apartment. And he got that license plate. So it took the police literally 30 minutes. And they took me from the hospital in the, in a, the patrol car to ID the house, which I did about seven thirty, eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, we were sitting out front of his house and then they waited and they, the police back then they would, and I love the police, but they were fantastic. They waited till the following morning at about 4 AM and they busted through that door and they drug him out naked and, uh, you know, he, I went to trial and, uh, it was, it was a tough experience. They had to, because what he would do is when I was going through it, explaining these awful things he did is he would sit there and he'd go to me when I'm on the stand and literally Jimmy, I just, I went into this position. That's all I remember. My body locked up. I couldn't move. And it took two, two of the, the uh, security men there. They literally had to pick me up. I couldn't release my legs. I was in a fetal position. There was nothing. I was frozen like this. And they carried me out of that courtroom. But he ha he decided to take a plea deal. Uh, one uh, pleaded to sodomy by force and got one year in county. And uh, they dropped the kidnapping, the beating, everything, all the sexual assault. Because it was, you know... Uh, arm's length what he had done and more so he pleaded guilty to sodomy by force got one year in county and uh i i think he's dead to be well, honest there, there's some good news at the end of the day right <laughs> i hope so i mean his name is richard wade wright and i tried to see if he was still alive you know the, these last several years and he is not to be found. So I, I'm hoping and praying that he's gone. There's some some relationships you just can't uh, forgive and you can't heal. You know, those are there's some instances like this where Kim Fowlery you, you could have, but in this situation you just can't. Oh forgive. no! Well, well yeah. people like like Richard Wade Wright, uh, that is something they will never stop. 
they it can never be rehabilitated. It is anyone that says they can is a liar. You can't do what was done to me and all of a sudden turn turn the turn the coin. It's impossible. The brutality, the hatred, the sexual need to injure, uh, to control. That is something that is, that's a mentally ill human being. So uh, I do believe either he changed his name and moved to Guadalajara or wherever, or he's dead. And I truly do hope he's dead. Mm -hmm. and that he didn't hurt other women. But I'm afraid that, that, that nothing stops someone like him. Yeah. Yeah, I, it should have been in the movie as a lesson, you know, to uh, to uh, as 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 a, as a warning and a lesson. I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, what's your relationship like with Joan Jett today? Uh, the fact that that Blackheart held my album for a decade, and after I opened for her, shut me down, didn't let me play a single show for two years. And that show, if you ever, if you go onto YouTube and watch uh, any of it from the Pacific Amphitheater, you're going to say, "What the hell?" I mean, I was, I was ready, Jimmy. I was good, and I took away. I I gave Joan something to compete with, obviously, and that was something that Kenny Laguna just couldn't have. And Kenny was my manager at the same time. And I get they were they had their eye on uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I don't know why they did it uh, to me. I, I wouldn't have done that to an enemy. You know, I considered them family. So, you know, I mean, we have ex exchanged, you know, happy birthdays, Merry Christmas, that kind of thing. Um, but she broke my heart, and she's not someone I trust. So. I'll always love her because of uh, what we went through in the band. I'll always have a love for her. But uh, what she did to me is just, is just horrendous. Wow. And they still have the record and they won't give it to me. Oh. So almost 15 years later, it's wrong. It's just wrong. You don't do that. There are two peas in a pod and they are joined at the hip. No doubt about it. And, you know, Joan was very, very lucky to have found Kenny, you know, manage. I mean, like, look at Lita. I mean, she, Sharon Osbourne made her a star, you know, and then Lita turns around and fires Sharon. If it yeah. wouldn't have been for Sharon Osbourne, Lita would have just, but there's so many better players than Lita Ford, so many better singers. Uh, and I'm not trying to put her down. There's so many better singers than me. But the thing is, is that they were lucky that, that Ke Kenny, Joan was very ill. She was in a hospital with, with uh, uh, her heart was, you know, enlarged and she was going to die. And Kenny literally turned her life around. You know, Lita and Joan, they both were, you know, on heroin at the time. I, I left the band before that. But when you owe someone your life, and, uh, you know, you, you uh, have this history and they lived together. I mean, you know, Kenny has his wife and daughter and lived in a beautiful house in New York. Uh, Joan stayed there until she, I guess, until maybe 20 years ago. She got she moved into uh, Kenny's uh, penthouse there in Long Island. And but otherwise, Joan. You know stayed with them as as a family for most of her adult life so this isn't you know this is a very unique situation and with you know joan is is their cash cow no doubt about that, that many like people a, yeah. make their living uh off of uh, joan yeah yeah and Let's kenny get and yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's fine. of course yeah, i mean i have happy. to give credit where credit's due kenny's ruthless and he did a really good job i really expected him to do that for me as well that's what he that's why he talked me into being my manager and talked me into signing a record contract i i really believed i believed him the last thing i ever thought even though matt sorum who produced the record 
said, I don't feel good about this. And it was like, how can you not? Boy, he was right. On a lighter note, tell me what people sure. can expect when they see you on tour in Europe. What songs are you going to play? And Well, I'm going to do all the cool Runaways songs. You know, all the staples, Cherry Bomb, American Nice, Queens of Noise, uh, Take It or Leave It, uh, uh, Come On. Uh, oh, I mean, it's a long list. Um, and I'm going to do some some songs from uh, Messing With The Boys. I'll do some songs from uh, my new album, Boulevards of Splendor, which Blackheart has. And uh, a couple of, you know, covers, of course. I'll be doing a song with, with uh, Stevie and Shameless as well. But I'm doing the songs that none of the other girls would ever do. Yeah. You know? Um, and Stevie's the voice of Tough. He will be on tour with you. I'm not sure if he's doing all the dates. Is he doing a few dates? Or yes. Was, he's doing most of them? He is. Th that he is. Yes. For this, yes. I believe so. Yes. Right. <laughs> I'm um, looking forward to it. Is there any other thing you want to promote? Show your book again? Is it still, uh, it's still people can purchase? Oh, I own the very last copies and they can get this book. I don't have any of the one, the, the newer version from it or Harper Collins that they have to get through Amazon. Uh, but um, I am producing a movie. I'm one All of right. the producers of a movie called leaving Amy. Okay. And uh, it, it follows a, a, a wonderful guy who was born a female, mm -hmm. um, even though, um, you know, the doctors and his mom believed that he was going to be a male because his testosterone was not, it was way off the charts for a female. But, but he transitioned in the horrors behind that. Uh, he's suffered damages that uh, he'll never, ever recover from. I need people to know that most of my friends are gay mm -hmm. or lesbian. And I have many transsexual friends, some for 48 years. I I am not a transphobe. I love the community. I fought for gay marriage, and I will fight to continue that that stays, by the way. But, you know, I just think that it's very important for people to understand that, that it's really just children. It's They're too young, and they're lying to kids as well. They are saying, and to parents, that these uh, cross-sex hormones are reversible. They are not reversible, Jimmy. They are not, and they cause lifelong damage. Uh, kids will, like Jazz, for instance, they started her at nine with these hormones. Never had an orgasm, never will. I'm sorry. I think that's kind of important to human beings uh, for intimacy and to be able to achieve that, which is a natural thing. They, they remove that from them. And uh, and also it, it sterilizes a lot of them as well. So I don't I want kids to be able to have a childhood. I want these people out of the school system. I want them to leave kids alone and let parents let parents deal with anything. You know, it's it's their kid. These aren't kids that belong to the state. And um, so it's just something that just like the chainsaw. When it called me 22 years ago, this movie and this this uh, fight has oh. chosen me as well. So it's not something I'm ever going to walk away you. from. Even though that they've canceled a couple of my shows now in November, I can't stop. If it means I never work again, that's fine. That's fine with me. This is far too important. So, so this, this is a documentary you're saying. This is not. It a is. Movie. It's, it's called it's, Leaving Amy. You can go to leavingamy.com and see the trailer. Uh. The voice of the Runaways will be going through Europe, Czechless, Czech Republic, Munich, Belgium, Holland, Aachen, Germany, starting July 25th, all the way to the beginning of August. Go check them out. Sheree, thank you so much. And thank you for explaining. Thank you, Jimmy. That. I Have appreciate a nice, it. Day.